Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning with verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Now I want you to just notice the word of the Lord because notice it said that God brought him out in the spirit and set him in a valley. You know a valley is a low place. Sometimes God has to set you in a low place to show you things about yourself. But he set him in a low place. And, and then verse 2, then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. Have you ever had something that was supposed to be moist but it was dry? Notice verse 3, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? In other words, is there any hope? Do you think that it's all over just because you messed up? Because you've experienced a divorce, a breakup in relationship, because you lost a job, because a, a house was foreclosed on, because a car was repossessed? Can these bones live? Is there hope? Is there really hope? And so he answered, oh God, you know. And then verse 4, again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. May I just remind you of this? Nothing, nothing, nothing is done in the kingdom of God until something is said. Nothing is done until something is said. And then verse 5, thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will cause breath to enter in you and you shall live. I'm, I'm entitling this series CPR, Creating Personal Revival. CPR, CPR. Whenever you are, uh, a person is immediately taken into an emergency room of a hospital, uh, they go through the ABCs. They want to make sure that the airways are open. The airways are opened and clear. Then they want to check your circulatory system. Uh, so they will, that's one of the reasons that they strip your clothes off, at least that's what they say. <laughs> you go in with a headache and wind up naked. <laughs> but they want to make sure that, that your breathing is, is good. You see, the C is the circulation. Uh, they have to check circulation because uh, they want to make sure you're not bleeding out somewhere. So they've got to make sure that everything that goes out of one part of the heart is circulating all the way through and coming back in through the right chambers because there are certain parts of the body, like in your abdominal cavity, where you don't really have nerve endings and you can be shot in the stomach and not know it. And so you could have a wound in your leg and be shot in the stomach and bleeding out in the leg and they stop the bleeding in the leg and you can be bleeding out in your, in your abdomen and not even know it. And so that's why they have to check circulation. There are things that can happen to you in your blood relationships. And you can be carrying a hurt and a harbor from something that an, a perverted uncle did to you. Are you listening? And you, you're an adult now and you don't even realize why you've got an issue with these certain kinds of folks. Because there's a trigger that is there. And there's certain things that happen in your life that can absolutely kill your spirit, that can make you where you, you don't know how to talk about certain things. You, you become very, very tacit in your dealings with people and you don't understand what, what is this that has happened to me. And so we can reach certain places in our life where we, we need a personal revival. I've seen folks that have grown up in the church and, uh, and their fire goes out. It's not that they were never set on fire, but the fire goes out. But I want you to notice the Bible here says, surely I will cause breath to enter in you and you shall live. Somebody shout live. live. You shall live. He says live now and not merely exist. I know a lot of people that only exist, but he said you shall live, not merely exist. You see, it's time for you to prophesy to your own life. Don't wait for a prophet to come in town. It's time for you to prophesy to your own life. Just like, remember how the caterpillar operates? The caterpillar, out of his own mouth, creates a cocoon, which is the environment in which its metamorphosis will take place. You can create an environment by what comes out of your own mouth. 
and what comes out, you can feel like a low worm, like a caterpillar, but you have the ability to transform how you look. If you came in the world looking like a worm, you don't have to go out like a worm. You don't, you, you're not, we're not responsible for how we come in the world, but you do determine the way you die. And so you can create with what comes out of your mouth an atmosphere. It's called a cocoon. Before God elevates, God always isolates or separates. And so he will allow your words to create a cocoon. With your words, you are snared. With your words, just the words of your mouth create the atmosphere in which your metamorphosis will take place. A friend of mine here in the city, his son, about 15 years old, was in a, a computer uh, writing class in high school. He came home and told his daddy one day, he said, Daddy, he said, if you learn the language, talking about the computer language, he says, you can create whatever is in your mind. There's a spiritual truth there that if you learn the language, you can create whatever is in your mind. That's why God is saying here to us uh, that if you prophesy to yourself, stop looking at yourself and acting as though it's, it's over, that you're washed up, that nobody wants you. I know people who speak death to themselves, but you have to learn to prophesy life to get the life back into your life. I mean, have you ever felt like uh, you, you're going through a dry spell in your life? Just, just dry, just, you don't know what's wrong and you just woke up and you're just in a dry spell. Have you ever wondered how to get your fire back? You, you, you're wondering, and you know, it's like I, I've lost my fire and, and I, I, I want to get my fire back in, in my life. Have you lost your cutting edge and you want to recover it? Well, when that happens, you, you, you have to ask yourself, what will it take for you to get your breath back? You know how life can hit you sometimes, pow, really hard, and it knocks the wind out of you, and you have to get your breath back? Do you know what discouragement is? Discouragement is exhaustion of the human soul. It is exhaustion. It's when your soul runs out of breath. So when you get exhausted, when you become discouraged, exhaustion of the human soul, it takes inspiration, inspired to breathe in. So when God breathes in, when a person has been with God and they begin to talk to you, you ought to be lifed by the word. Now something is severely wrong with me if you leave here depressed today. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I might need to check myself into rehab. If you leave depressed today, and, and, uh, and maybe I'd need to go back to school if you leave bored. I believe it's a sin to bore people. I know some people who've committed it. I mean, I've needed to, I felt like I needed to, some, uh, what do you call that stuff that just tastes, just, it's not espresso mixed with Red Bull. To be able to pay attention to some folks. <laughs> but have you ever gone through a certain part of your life and you've done the best that you could do? And you know, and other folks are looking at you and wondering why you're not doing any better, and you're doing the best that you know how to do, and you just need a second wind. And when you're in life, you realize we don't control the direction of the wind, but you can set your sail. You can adjust your sails to catch the wind and use that wind to propel you in whichever direction you need to go. But the issue is you got to know where you want to go because if you don't know where you want to go, any road in life will take you there. Any road will take you there. And are you aware of the fact that he who sets others on fire must be on fire himself? John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, when he was kicked out of the Orthodox Church and then more folks started coming to hear him out in the wilderness preaching than were going to the Orthodox Church and they, they came and asked him, you know, what's your secret? And he said, John Wesley sets himself on fire and people come to watch him burn. <laughs> and the question is, is there anything burning in you where folks will turn aside and see this sight? where it is burning, but it is not consuming you. That's the way, remember in the burning bush, the bush was on fire, but it wasn't a pile of ashes. 
it was not consumed. We've got to be set on fire with something in order to set other folks on fire. And so here's step number one. When, when the Lord awakened me at 3 o'clock in the morning and began to pour this message into me, he laid out in a moment of time seven series, seven part series, and I'm going to give you part one today on CPR or creating personal revival. Now you may not, you see, you're not responsible for your mama's soul being set on fire and your daddy's soul and your brothers and your sisters and your son and your daughters, but you are responsible for your soul being on fire. And uh, if you set yourself on fire, if I just light a candle in, on top of my head, if there's a wick on me, and if I light that wick, I can then lean over and light other wicks that are out. But I've got to be on fire myself. I, I can't give you a light if I don't have one myself. And so we've got to be set on fire with the personal fire because we've had a divine encounter with something that is hot, that has set your heart ablaze. So here's his, his key number one, is to go back to rediscover your purpose. Go back to rediscover your purpose. Purpose. Go back and rediscover your purpose. Whenever you find people who have had their fire to go out, you've got to back, back up to purpose in their life. Go back to purpose. If you ever lose something of value, you should immediately, I mean, what do we do if we, if we, lose something of value, you have to retrace your steps to the last place that you had it. I mean, if it was a ring that you pulled off when you were washing dishes, you got to say, when the world did I do with my ring? What did I do with my watch? Where's my cell phone? Where are my keys? And you have to re-step. I'm talking about these young folks whose minds have symptoms of Alzheimer's. <laughs> and you have to end up retracing your steps and, and you, you, you're going up the steps and you stop halfway and now you can't remember was I going up or coming down. <laughs> I mean, you, you stop and you turn in a room and was I going in or coming out? And it's really serious when, when you're in the bathroom and you got one leg over and the telephone rings and then you wonder, was I getting in or coming out? But you've got to go back and retrace your steps to the place that you last had it. Go back and retrace your steps. You remember when it was a miracle that the prophet Elijah did when uh, an axe head, an iron axe head fell over into the water and, uh, and, and they had to go back and get it. And he went back and put a stick in the water. The Lord said, go back and put a stick and the axe head floated. You know what I call that? recovering your cutting edge. An ax head is a cutting edge. He had lost the cutting edge. You can be working every day and lose your cutting edge. And so how do you go back and recover your cutting edge? You, you have to go back to the place where you lost it. And we learned that from that passage of Scripture. You go back to where it fell off, where you lost it, and put a stick to it. Do you get it? You go back to where you lost it, and then stick to what you were doing before you lost it. Go back to where you lost it and put a stick to it. You got to go back to the very thing that had set you ablaze to begin with and then put a stick to it. Go back and put, it, put a stick to it. You know, when most people become frustrated in their current place in life, they will generally revert to the last thing that they knew how to do well, whether it was legal or not. Honestly, if a man becomes frustrated and he's in dire straits, what he does is that he goes back to the last thing that he knew how to do well. It, it, I mean, he could be working in corporate America, but you know, if he came from the street and if he used to hustle, if you get him in a jam bad enough, he's going to go back and get his hustle on. They will go back to the last thing they knew how to do. Touch your neighbor, say, I know somebody like that. I mean, if our car breaks down, you have to go back to the owner's manual to figure out how it was originally designed. You know how some folks, uh, they're, they're, everybody has somebody like this in their family who, who ain't not going to pay anybody to do something that they can do themselves. <laughs> well, I can fix that, you know, just give me the owner manual. I, I'm, I'll change my own oil. No, I'm going to put a new engine in it myself. <laughs> and you see these folks, they have stuff everywhere and they get the owner's manual. You got to get the owner's 
manual, the owner's manual. You're like, I ain't gonna pay nobody $275 to do this, I can go out there. And they tinkering around in the air conditioning, heating unit, trying to put the washing machine back together. <laughs> That's something they ain't gonna pay anybody to do anything. They ain't gonna, hey, give me the, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get that screwdriver, I'm gonna. But you at least need an owner's manual because in the owner's manual, they'll tell you and identify all of the parts and it will describe how it is uh, created to function, how it is created to function. In order to know how to fix something, you got to know how it was originally designed to work. And so if something is not working, we call it dysfunctional. If it is not working, we call it dysfunctional. And so when you ask some people about their purpose in life, you'll hear some responses like this. Uh, I want to be happy. And they think that that's their purpose in life. May I remind you of this? God didn't put you in the earth just to be happy. Because you're not going to always be happy. Some people get married thinking that you get married and live happily ever after. I just hate that illusion. <laughs> God's not interested in your happiness. He's interested in your development. But sometimes when you're getting developed, you'll go through some unhappy moments. You don't get married just to be happy. You'll get married so that you can be holy. And out of your holiness comes your happiness. Because if you don't have any holiness in your life, and you're hooked up with somebody, your happiness won't last. Happiness is always dependent on what happens. And so when the happenings are not happening anymore, then you're no longer happy. And so there has to be a deeper thing. And so the purpose of a spouse is to help make you holy. That's why the person that you're with has this uncanny ability to irritate the tar out of you. They can become so cantankerous and so contumacious and iconoclastic that it begins to really get up underneath your skin. If, if you've never, I mean, when you love people, uh, your, your love for people is the thing that can cause them to irritate you. I'm not bothered by people out in the street that I don't know. They don't bother you. But if it's somebody that I know, that I love, and, and, and I feel like you ought to know better than this. That's what angers me, is when you know that they know better. It's like, I done told you. <laughs> and see, if your whole purpose in life is being happy, you're going to be a confused puppy. If it's just your whole desire. And then here's another people, some other folks say, what's your person? And some folks say, I just want to be rich. I just want to be rich. Let me just tell you this. <laughs> Do you know how many unhappy rich people that there are in the world? Shakespeare said that happiness is not having what you want, happiness is wanting what you have. Being rich is not determined by how much you have, it's determined by how little you need. How little you need. And, and then here's another person say, well, I want to be rich and happy. And that's the whole extent of their purpose, to be rich and happy. Do you think that God just puts you here in the earth just so you could be rich and you could be happy and for no other reason? Then, and then I've heard some people say, you know what, I, I, I want to be famous. Oh, really? So you crave attention like that. Other folks say, you know, they feel like their whole purpose is to just take care of their family. Some other folks, is just their purpose is to retire with a nest egg, nice nest egg. Some people have a more lofty kind of a purpose and they'll say things like to honor and to serve God in all that I do. That's their purpose. Some have a, this philanthropic kind of an idea to make the world a better place. I want to make the world a better place. Others are more ethereal to just simply say to be the best person that I can be. And some say that my purpose is to live life to the fullest. And then some will use this little fill-in-the-blank thing to become a good, whether it's doctor or lawyer or architect or teacher or accountant or singer or actor or playwright or a cook or an artist or an interior designer, or whatever it is, they just want to be a good one of those and that's what they feel as though their purpose is. 
May I share something with you that a little blind girl said by the name of Helen Keller? And interesting, when they, somebody asked her years ago what could be worse than to be deaf and mute and blind, and she said to be born having sight but no vision. And here's what Helen Keller said. She said, many people have a wrong idea of what constitutes true happiness. It is not attained through self-gratification, but through fidelity to a worthy purpose. If you don't have a worthy purpose in your life, your happiness is shallow. There must be a dedication to a worthy purpose, a worthy, worthy purpose. The Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, he said this, he says, don't aim at success. He says, the more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success like happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a personal a person other than oneself happiness must happen and the same holds uh, true for success you have to let it happen by not caring about it i want you to listen to what your cautious commands you to do and go on and carry it out to the best of your knowledge and then you will you will live to see that in the long run in the long run i say success will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think about it. You'd be surprised. Success is oftentimes the result of a person who is passionately in love with their purpose and pursuing it with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. In 1686, Isaac Newton specified that any object, any object, that continues doing whatever it is currently doing, that it'll keep on doing it unless it is acted on by some external force. It's interesting. In other words, uh, Isaac Newton's theory basically says that an object in motion stays in motion and an object at rest stays at rest unless something, some external force acts on it. It has to be wind resistance and brakes applied or something that then stops the moving thing. But if you leave all things constant with no external force acting on it, if an object is in motion, it'll stay in motion. If you drop something and it falls to the ground, it'll stay in motion unless the ground interrupts that in the external force. You see, so whatever is set in motion in your life, unless there's an external force, it'll keep on doing it. So if your life today, if your life today is not acted on by an external force, an external force, you will keep on in the direction where you're headed. Unless an external force, that has to be a divine intervention. You know how many folks have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, and you have to have an intervention for people who have problems, an external force acting on them to stop them from destructive behavior? But it's hard to help people that don't want to be helped. I just, I just let them go on until they decide I'm ready to be helped. Because you really honestly can't help people until they are ready to be helped. And when they are ready to be helped, then you can help them. But an object in motion stays in motion unless an external force acts on it. And then an, an object at rest stays at rest. Like some folks who just sit around the house and they'll never go get a job. Unless an external force. Here's the operative word, force. <laughs> An external force. There are certain people. Now, here's the external force that you ought to be able to make to bring change in your own life because it's us basically saying that your life is going to remain the same unless you do something. Unless you do something about it, your life is going to remain the same. Let me just remind you of this. Your life today, your life today, however your life, if you're happy today, if you've got money today, your life will remain, uh, is determined 10 years down the road. 10 years down the road, your life is determined by the books that you read, by the people that you meet, and by the experiences that you have. Those three things. Unless you read something or meet somebody or experience something 10 years down the road, your life will be the same. If you don't have a cataclysmic encounter with somebody who comes into your life who loves you, with a God who moves as an external force to stop you on your road to complacency, 
because you allow your last little success and you become satisfied with yesterday's success. That's the breeding ground for all mediocrity and ultimate failure in life. Because individuals are more in love with security of having a job than they are with pursuing opportunity. And when you get to a place where you, you've got to say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of just going to a nine to five every day, having the deal that I, I believe that, listen, and I, I pray that, I pray that God will use me as a catalytic provocation in your life today. I, I want to be an irritant. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Broder. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.